It's great to be a church, isn't it? It's great to be here. It's great to be worshiping God. It's great to be together. And I continue to feel a conviction that things can happen here that can't happen anywhere else. And so what we want to do is continue to focus in on God and continue to grow together. So let's pray. Lord, I'm grateful for Church One. And beyond Church One, I'm grateful for the Church of Baltimore. I'm grateful for all the places right now in this community where your name is being lifted up. And may we be one of those voices this morning. May we honor you. May we praise you. May we glorify you. And now as we open up your word, may we think clearly about who you are and who we are. Because, Lord, you say that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And I want to pray for us as a congregation this morning that we would be renewed by our minds. In your name we pray. Amen. So think, for, think with me for a moment about uh, what you would describe as God moments. Those kind of moments in life where you say, man, I was just so aware of the presence of God. It felt like God was obvious and all around us. My hunch is if you even are beginning to process that, you're thinking of maybe beautiful moments. Moments where you're caught out in nature and nature just seems so amazing and there's a sense of awe and wonder. Or perhaps it's a moment of deep love and affection with people that you care about or a a sense of community or an opportunity to serve someone in need. The idea behind it is that I think when we consider God moments, we tend to shroud them in a certain sense of awe and beauty and and wonder and, and, and good things. I wonder how many of us would list forgiveness as a God moment. We don't often think of forgiveness in that category of that moment of blessing, that time of life where God was ever present. But really, as you think about it, what would life be without forgiveness? You don't have to think too hard about that at all because I think we get to experience it a lot. We all experience every day what happens when forgiveness is not entered into the system. If you take almost any act of violence that we observe, whether it's locally, whether it's globally, almost any act of violence that we observe has at its core a lack of forgiveness. There is some kind of enmity between groups of people that They did this to me, so we do this to them, and then they do this back, and then we do this back, and it all traces back to this inability to forgive. Or how about on a personal level? You know, it might be office politics, or neighborhood tensions, or cliques at school, or family strife. All of them have at their core this need for forgiveness that just feels impossible to offer. Yet forgiveness is right at the center of God's heart. Think of Israel in the Old Testament. Again and again and again, they they talked about how the mercy of God, God's unfailing, undeserved mercy was the only thing that kept them alive. And this idea of forgiveness and being at the heart of God in the Bible builds to a peak with Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made him who knew no sin, to become sin for us. Jesus' whole mission was a mission steeped in forgiveness. So much so that when we experience forgiveness, we are experiencing the heart of God. Like love, it is, you know, it's often said it is hard to be in love and not somehow believe there is a God. And I would argue in the same way that it is hard to be forgiven and not somehow feel like there is more to the picture. And I think that is certainly how the Psalms would want us to understand this. You know, Psalms is the worship book in the Bible, and the Psalms itself um, has at least over 10 Psalms that talk about the power of forgiveness. When the, when the 
God's people were called together in worship, it seems that one of the things that God wanted to get your attention with was this thing called forgiveness. We tend to think of forgiveness as this negative moment, this this vulnerable moment where our frailties are laid out before a holy God, but God sees it as a blessing. God sees it as a moment of worship. And I want us to begin to see that this morning. And I want to do it by looking at Psalm 32, which we read earlier, but I want to try to answer three questions that I think this psalm points us to about the heart of forgiveness. And the first question is, why is forgiveness so important? The second is, what do we need to do to experience it? And lastly, how is it possible? The first question then is, is why is forgiveness so important? To experience this forgiveness, especially from God, I think means this first, that to experience forgiveness from God means that you have an authentic relationship with God. There is something about the experience of forgiveness that brings with it a sense of authenticity. Let's look at uh, this the psalm again, Psalm 32, starting in verse 1 and 2. The psalmist says this, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. And that's the line. The psalmist says that when you experience forgiveness, you begin to live life in complete honesty. There is something incredibly authentic about being forgiven. Because the the forgiven person has faced a reality that they've tried to avoid and instead has, has stepped up, owned the consequences for what they've done, and now they're able to live in honesty. You know, authenticity is an overused word, I know that. Some of you probably cringe when even I say it. But there is something that we crave about it, isn't there? I mean, who, who gets up in the morning and says, I really want to be fake today? Or my favorite people in the world are those fake people out there. I love when people just blow smoke and sunshine. It really makes me feel good about them. Right? But yet we cover up all the time. We, we don't want to be authentic. We don't want to be known. But But the psalmist says when you live like that, you don't live in complete honesty. Brene Brown, who Sarah quoted last week, I think has a great quote on what the core of authenticity is. Authenticity isn't a celebrity crying on the couch with Oprah, okay? Authenticity is much bigger than that. The core of authenticity, Brene Brown says this, is the courage to be imperfect, vulnerable, and to set boundaries. Now there's a lot in that quote, and I'm not going to get to all of it, but I want to draw your attention to this idea about the courage to be imperfect. I'm not talking here about like pseudo-confession. I'm talking about real imperfection. Because one thing she says is that the courage to be imperfect brings with it a vulnerability. There are things that I will admit to in front of you in my sermons. Usually you guys like those things. You laugh along with me at those things. And those things are true. But there are imperfections about me that are much more difficult for me to own. And I know when I'm admitting to those imperfections, when the instant response inside of my soul is vulnerability. And Brene Brown, I think, rightly says that that to be authentic is to embrace the courage to be imperfect. 
the psalmist says that we are blessed when we are forgiven because we realize our weaknesses, our imperfections, our failures do not define us. That's why he says you're blessed because you're like, wow, wait a minute. Like that's not the whole story about me? That I can have these imperfections and yet I'm still accepted? It takes tremendous courage. Sometimes, I I remember a church service a a few weeks back where um, they gave us an opportunity to confess. And I have to be honest with you, when I'm given that opportunity kind of right away, I sort of have certain surface level sins, you know, that I, I kind of run a little checklist by. And, and I'm not joking. I'm not proud of this, but I'm not joking. But I remember the time of confession. I remember just saying, yeah, I think I'm all right, God. Like, I, I can't really think of anything. And God has graciously responded to that prayer in the last three or four weeks. And brought, brung some things to awareness. And maybe you're like that. Maybe when I'm up here talking about being authentic and real imperfections, you're kind of like, well, you know, I mean, I've got my little things, but you know, I'm managing them okay. Well, here's a little test I like to do. Here's a little test that might give you a little more perspective on yourself. And I've shared this before, but I call it the seven-year test. I want you to stop right now and think of yourself seven years ago. What you were like. What was important to you. Who you really were. Very often when you do that, right? Sometimes there's good things that come to mind, but very often I think when you do that, there's a certain cringe factor, isn't there? Like, man, was I really like that? Was that really that important to me? Like, how did I get so sucked into this situation? See, I think the psalmist says, man, it it takes real courage, and it's a real blessing to be authentic, to be honest before God about your real imperfections and to be courageous about them. But if that were all that sin was, right? Sin is certainly imperfection, right? Can we agree with that? But if that were the only energy behind sin, sort of like your own little imperfections or your problems, if that was all that sin was about, then I think we would, we would kind of gloss over it. I don't think it would have the spiritual weight. But, but sin, and the psalmist points to this, and the Bible points to this, sin is more than imperfection. Sin always has a relational component to to it. And that relational component brings with it a sense of alienation. You know you're tracking in the territory of sin when there is an alienating energy around it. When the sin itself is separating you from other people, from God, or even from yourself. And we see that when we look at the book of Genesis and the very first sin, the very first reaction that Adam and Eve had after they had sinned was to hide. Because all of a sudden, it wasn't just a, whoops, I ate the apple, right? There was a certain sense that I am eating this apple as an act of defiance an alienation against God. And I know when I do this, all of a sudden, there is a separation from me and from God. I, I remember again, it's one of those classic stories, but when, when my, one day when my, uh, Molly and Michael were little, little, they found the hose and they took the hose around the back and I was walk, walking on my side, working on my side yard and I could hear them running the hose and laughing, right? And every once in a while, they would put the hose down, run around to the side yard and say, Dad, whatever you do, don't come around back. Right? Because they didn't want to be seen. And there's a certain element of sin that that's what makes it sin, is that you're doing it and you alienate those around you. And sometimes you even alienate yourself. Right? 
I think a lot of the reasons why people don't want to go to church or don't come to church is because they feel like when I'm in church, there's this part of me, right, that I know is real and true about me that wouldn't look good in church. And so I feel fake when I'm at church. And the reason they feel fake is because there's something inside of, they've alienated themselves from themselves. Because that's what sin does. I love this, this image, this picture. This is, a, this is an artist rendering, I think we have it, there, of, of the first sin. Of Adam and Eve after they committed the first sin. And what you see is shame and covering up and hiding. Sin brings with it this sense of alienation. And that's what forgiveness is so beautiful about because forgiveness puts an end to the alienation from God and from each other and from yourself. Forgiveness is being set free, but it's even more than that. It is an integration of ourselves. Where sin disintegrated, forgiveness integrates. It brings back together again. And it is not easy at all. God has a ton of grace, and you're going to need a ton of grace for yourself to really experience forgiveness. Because forgiveness allows us to move from alienation to integration. And that is so much of the spiritual energy behind it. So that's why sin is so important. But I don't want to end there. I don't want this to just be an esoteric uh, philosophical treatise about sin. I think the psalmist doesn't either. He wants us to really know what is it we can do. And in Psalm 32 verses 5 and 6, he says this, Finally, I confessed my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. What is it that we do with sin? What do we do? How do we, how do we experience forgiveness? What is necessary from our side of the equation? And the psalmist clearly points to it. He says the word twice in the passage I just read to you. He says the, the word confess confess. Confess is uh, uh, it's a combination of two Greek words, uh, it, and essentially it just means to agree with. And when you are called to confess, what you're doing is you're agreeing with God about the problem. That's what, that's what confession is. It's, it's, it's agreeing. It's owning up to it. And what we need to begin to be able to practice, right? We, we like to talk about spiritual practices. Church One, one of our big values is spiritual practice. Well, we need to begin to continue to develop the practice of confession. The practice of agreeing with God about our sins. And so here's the first thing that you need to be able to do if you're going to agree with God about your sin, is you're going to have to learn to recognize the voice of God. Because there are other voices out there around your sin. There is the voice of condemnation, right? When we sin, we hear that voice. And that voice tells us that you're no good, that if you're exposed, you're busted. If, if you admit to this, you're toast. There's the voice of condemnation, right? And that is not the voice of God. You will not confess, you will not agree with God about your sin if the voice of condemnation is the only voice you hear. The voice of God is a voice of conviction. Conviction is much different. Conviction brings with it an awareness of the problem with a vision of what is right. 
convictions it will, will point out the problem, but it will be encased in a picture of what is right and good. And when God convicts you, that is when you confess. And that's all you're called to do is simply confess. So let me ask you a question this morning. Is God trying to get you to agree to something? Do you have anyone that you can share it with? Confession should be a powerful part of our prayer life. It should be a time where we allow God to speak to us. One of the other values we have at Church One is this value of spiritual friendship. And one of the things that we need to do as spiritual friends is we need to have friends that we can confess to. The other day I was angry about something. I was angry, I felt slighted, and I was frustrated, and I, and, and, I, and I knew my mindset was wrong, and so I called up a friend. He goes to this church, and I called him up, and I said, I'm ticked, and I'm thinking a lot of bad thoughts, and I'm about to act, and I need your help. I need to tell you what's going on, but deeper than that, I need to confess to you, right, I want to agree with God that there's a right way to handle this situation, and I'm not handling it well right now. Now, I I couldn't have done that if I didn't have a spiritual friend. And I wouldn't have that spiritual friend if I hadn't been intentional about getting together with someone and, and being honest about what's going on in my life. So... What do we do? We, you know, why is it important? Because it's authentic and it leads to integration. What do we do? We learn to confess. But lastly, how is it possible? In Psalm 32, verse 6, the passage that I just read, it sort of ends right with this little, this little challenge. The psalmist has talked about what a joy it is to be forgiven. And he, and, and he encourages us to confess. And then he says, Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the flood waters of judgment. How is it possible that our sins can be forgiven? I love that image, imagery of the flood waters of judgment. I think it points to the reason why confession is so scary. Because we think if we confess, the floodwaters of judgment are just going to come rushing over the us. We think if I admit to this, if if I acknowledge that this imperfection in me, that God will run with this and God will use this against me. So sin makes us run away. It makes us hide because we hear the floodwaters of judgment rushing down on us. We know our sin demands from us a price that we cannot pay. I think we all know intuitively that we cannot swim in the floodwaters of judgment. And we also think deep down, like, it really can't be this easy. It, you, you really can't be telling me, God, that if I just agree with you that this is wrong, that you'll forgive me. There is no way it's that simple. That seems to be a giant get-out-of-jail-free card that people would just abuse. And we all know intuitively that when we sin, the floodwaters of judgment come rushing down. So how can it be so simple that we just confess and we forgive? Because we know someone has to drown in the floodwaters of judgment. And someone did. Someone did. Jesus himself drowned in the floodwaters of judgment so that we could swim above them. We float above the water because Jesus submerged himself into the waters. So you're right, forgiveness isn't that easy. Forgiveness required everything from God. The sin that disintegrates and alienates and destroyed us had to be paid for, and Jesus paid for it. And that is why forgiveness is such a blessing. It not only allows us to be honest about our own hearts, but it enables us to see and experience God's heart. While sin makes us run and hide from the floodwaters of judgment, 
Jesus pursues us. And that's a blessing. And that is a God moment. Let's pray. Lord, I, I want to just give us a moment to pause and to agree with you. To agree with you about areas of sin in our lives. To recognize places where we have allowed disintegration to come in. Where we have alienated ourselves from others, from you, from even ourselves. By our actions, our attitudes. By things that we've done and things that we haven't done, Lord. Lord, I know that we can't be aware of every sin we've ever committed or it would crush us. But my hunch is that there are some sins that you want us to agree with you about because they are crushing us. So Lord, I, give my, I pray for my friends, I pray for myself, the courage to be imperfect this morning. The capacity to agree with you and to receive the blessing of your forgiveness. Help us confess, O oh Lord.